around all the time. You're saying I want to do the work better. Yes, but... Now, that was the kind I... of morality but... I was brought up with. But... Don't do a job just for what you get. You do the job because but... you want to do it well. Oh, but, Kenneth, can I say I think that's crap? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I, I really... I've never been so insulted. <laughs> uh, Kenneth... Well, that was a, a friendly encounter with Kenneth Williams in 1973. It's true to say that in those early days of our professional relationship, we didn't like each other. Indeed, in his published diaries, Kenneth Williams states, I was asked if I would go to Thames Television and chat to Michael Parkinson. Certainly not North Country Knit. When we did bump into each other, he was a panelist on What's My Line, and I was a guest. He wrote in his diary, the first celebrity was Michael Parkinson whom I loathe. And it must have said, the feeling was mutual. At first, I couldn't stand him. So how come he was one of the regular guests on the show, so much so that tonight we pay him special tribute? Well, one reason was he loved showing off, and we loved giving him the chance to do so. He was camp, funny, and wonderfully entertaining. Here's an example of Kenneth Williams at his very best from a show we did in 1980. The other guests are the American humorist and songwriter Tom Lehrer and Robin Ray. Since we last met, uh, since we last talked here, um, you published uh, a while ago this successful book called Acid Drops, which yeah. is a your collection of, sort of verbal put-downs, I suppose, the best general. Yes, I, I thought tart retorts, but the, somebody else said, no, acid drops is better, because yeah. the tartness is in the acidity, and the drop about them being put, uh, put down, so to speak, is in acid drops. So I thought it was a better title. Yeah. Well, why, why, but why did you pick that particular kind of art form to be that, to, to write about? Why well, I picked it because it, the, I've, been, I've done a lot of these quote-unquote shows. Yes. And Giles Brandreth, who was editing this book, said to me, you obviously enjoy, don't you, the malignant thrust and the rude retort. And he said, you do deliver them with a degree of relish. And I said, yes, I do enjoy them. And he said, why don't we do a book all about them? So that's, what, that's how it all occurred. Because I'd gone along to the programme for quote-unquote with my various uh, bits and pieces. And the producer always said, bring quite a few, because we may find that what you think is funny is not broadcastable. And, um, and so, and one almost had to have quite a few spares, you know. But I remember taking along to him one, which I thought was a lovely one, and that was a true account. Stanley Baxter told me in a London club he'd heard two men, and one said, I've just come from Evita. And the other one said, oh, don't look very brown. <laughs> I remember thinking that was a marvellous one, but he said, no, it's not what we want. So I put that in my spare book, you know. And I put a lot of other spare things in the diaries, which I keep, because I've kept them since I was 14. But when did you d d discover this, this liking, or indeed your talent for what you describe as the malignant, malignant thrust? Well, I suppose because I've so often been a victim, do you see, of aggression. And I found very early on in life, I'm a small person, and I found very early on in life that if you didn't have the the sort of retort that was necessary to put down people who were rude uh, and bullying, then you couldn't do it in any other way. I mean, you couldn't do it. I, could, I had to do it verbally. I couldn't do it physically. You started this as a, a schoolboy, then? Yes, I think that was the first occasion, yes. I used to use the tongue to be vituperative. But the malignant th thrust of the tongue often gets you wallop round the ear all. I mean, did you need a, a bodyguard? Yes, I always had one, you handy. <laughs> yes, I, I cultivated the friendship of very big people. <laughs> and um, I got very well in with the captain of the school uh, football team and, and the captain of the cricket team. I got in well with all those big chaps. And I thoroughly enjoyed them. They'd always bash people for me, you see. <laughs> and I loved that. I did it in the army as well. I always kept well in the area of protection from those sort of people. Mm. What about when in compiling the book? Did you, in fact, come across any one section of the of the um, of life in which it was the the put down was more uh, rich in area than than others? I mean, is it I don't know theatre? Is it politics? Is it well, no, I think it covers almost everything. I mean, I love that Effie Smith one, you know, where he, after a lengthy preamble in front of the judge, the judge said, I've listened to your arguments, they are very lengthy, and I'm none, frankly, Mr. Smith, I'm none the wiser. And he's no, my lord, but doubtless better informed. 
And that, I find, is a... I, I think that's a marvellous put-down, mm. but it's essentially erudite. It belongs very much to the realm of mm. uh, the legal system. There's also, of course, in the book, there's a marvellous collection of, uh, of quotes and incidents uh, of, of theatrical characters, rich theatrical characters. Yes, there are, uh, but there are several that I, I wanted to do and then thought afterwards, oh, I should have put that and forgot, you know what I mean? And that will have to be in the next edition. They're having a reprint, incidentally, so that's very nice to know because they've sold them all. And so we're having to do it all again. And one that I really would have loved to have been in, because I think it's a marvellous put down, and in a sense, it's, it's, it's the essence of theatre. And it was told me by Jeremy Swan, who knew the man that was in charge of this company. It was Robert Heltman doing a tour of uh, this ballet, Midsummer Night's Dream, and he was playing Oberon, and they played it in a, in a vast sports arena. It was floodlit. And every actor, of course, or dancer or whatever, was given um, rooms which were essentially for sports people. And they gave Robert Heltman what they thought was the best room, the umpire's room. And when the man came around to the half, he knocks on the door and says, half an hour, please, half an hour, please. He didn't get any answer. And he went in and found in this umpire's room Robert Heltman on a chair which was on the table. So he was up on this chair on the table with a mirror against the one naked light bulb doing this very elaborate eye makeup, which was green and gold. And he was up there doing this, and he said, are you all right? And Robert Hoffman said, yes, I'm fine, but God knows how these umpires manage. <laughs> 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 conveys that wonderful <laughs> sense of theatre. People who are in the theatre imagine, do they not, that the world revolves about that mm. particular mm. area and not about any other. Edith Evans was comparable because she had this extraordinary ability to rise above any kind of adversity. I remember after Gentle Jack, there was terrible booing and shouting. And she said to me as the curtain fell, Well, I heard one brother. And I said, no, that was go home. <laughs> oh, how very rude. <laughs> when we came out of the theatre, she said to me, did they give you any notes? And I said, yes, I got a couple of notes. Did they give you any? And she said, well, Binky said, Hardy Amy's has designed very regal costumes. You should look equally regal in them. <laughs> should you think that's justified? And I said, no, I think any criticism of your deportment is tantamount to impertinence. And she said, yes. <laughs> You're a very pleasant young man. <laughs> and there's no reason why the right girl shouldn't come along. <laughs> Which obviously she regarded as the reward for any sort of virtue. <laughs> then we got into the taxi and got back to this hotel where we were staying. And we were the only two because everyone else had dined, you know, we were... Well, it was 11 o'clock at night, you know, and everyone else had gone. But these two tin plates were over a bit of cold ham and lettuce. And we sat in the corner of this empty room. And an old fart, who was the night porter, <laughs> was the night porter, who was deputising both as night porter and waiter, came in and said to Dame Edith, Your partner in crime, Zyda Grub. <laughs> And the partner in crime was her advisor on spiritual matters. <laughs> and accompanied her on this tour. Well, she was a Christian scientist. That's right. And would not take any medicines, but believed that spiritual faith would resolve any kind of illness. And he said, your partner in crime's had her grub. She couldn't wait about till half past eleven when you were starting. But she said she might want a drop of wine. Do you fancy a drop? And she said, oh, yes, a half bottle of Beaujolais <laughs> would not come amiss. He said, I thought you'd fancy that. I've got a drop in the sideboard for you. And, and bent over to get it and, and then broke wind with alarming, <laughs> alarming <laughs> ferocity. It really rang out appalling. And, and she said to me, this place has gone off terribly. <laughs> and, and I thought, I thought that would be a great composure. <laughs> Great composure and presence of mind. And it's, it's something, I think, which is, it does run through theatre, because I recall when I first worked with Maggie Smith in television, they did a thing called Acting in the 60s, and I said to her afterwards, you're extraordinarily relaxed, aren't you? I mean, the head was so, so relaxed. And she said, oh, that's because I had so many fillings. My head's top-heavy with lead. <laughs> it, keeps, it keeps falling forward. And when we went to Fortnum and Mason, where she was after a particular kind of bra, 
a very grand assistant in Fortnum's, which was heavy carpeting, beautiful, uh, very soft pile, you hardly heard as you entered. This woman said, yes, I have that particular bra, ma'am, and she said it was seven guineas, and, and Max said, seven guineas for a bra? Mm. She put up your tits off. <laughs> The case, the case, was own up for. I obviously they have never heard anyone being quite so forthright <laughs> before in that kind of establishment. One of the real fascinations of doing the Parkinson show was in putting together combinations of people and trying to achieve a conversational blend. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But when it did, the result was memorable. In 1972, we brought together the then Port Laureate, Sir John Betjeman, the actress Maggie Smith, and Kenneth Williams. Now, they liked each other, but Kenneth and I were having problems. I was dying, actually, to go to the loo back there. I really was. <laughs> and I went. kept thinking, no, I kept thinking, I'll miss a bit, you know. I'll miss a bit that's really important. And I, I, they said to me, go on, you must stand by. And I was glued to it, watching. <laughs> what about, I'd like to ask all of you, actually, about, uh, about critics. I Who's... loathe them, and I've got a record of saying how much I loathe them so many times. It's almost become commonplace, you know. I regard them as... But can I've it... always said they're the eunuchs and the harem, you know. They're there every night, they see it done every night, but they can't do it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> they're absolutely useless, you see, and there's a marvelous... But they're not always, <coughs> Ken, because always there's a grain of truth. That's what's so unnerving. Hardly ever, and even if okay. there were, even if there were, Maggie, I would say this. They might, uh, they might, in what they say, be saying something true, but they've hardly ever earned the right to say it. You see, that's well, the point. Yes, that's but, the real point. Yeah. You see, people like um, these sort of, you know, would-be doyens. They write in Sunday newspapers and look upon themselves as sort of, you know, augurs of what's good taste and what's bad taste. They sit there as though from Olympian heights, you know, discussing other people's work and often damning them in the process. I could show you cuttings that name people as being the best. You know, one of the critics said, not only the best in the Western Hemisphere, nay, N-A-Y, nay. nay, the world. <laughs> and went on to name people that have trod a path into oblivion. I I've not heard of them ever since, you know. <laughs> and so you begin to think, well, what are they worth? Yeah, they're all useless, you see. Yes. Because half the time, they're not really doing what a critic should do, that is communicate some sort of affection and love for his subject to I the reader. You, they're really not doing that. What they're really doing is turning a fashionable phrase that might make them well known, them a reputation, you know what I mean? I yes. don't honestly yes. think you can lump them all together because there are, you know, there are some serious ones I mean, and you can learn things the, 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 basically, sometimes change. You're, 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 you would say that they're, they're to put it crudely, pleasuring themselves rather than... than well, they're poor things. things, they've got a rotten job, obviously. I mean, oh. it's a rotten job, I admit, I admit that. Like it's, a, it's a very oh. frustrating job. I know a lot of them are sort of, what is it, short? A lot of them were frustrated playwrights mm. or something. Um, a lot of them frustrated actors, probably. But, um, you know, um, Russell Lovell said that uh, there's something fundamentally ridiculous about criticism insofar as what is good is good without us saying so. Yes, yeah. yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And, and that, I suppose, really exposes the whole thing. And it also brings out the truth of what you said, that the um, communicating enthusiasm Precisely. is what you should do. That's yes. what they should be doing. Now, there are certain people that can do it. There are. I mean, I've read Rex Reed, you know, those profiles in New Yorker, and he really does communicate an atmosphere. You do feel, if you're reading that kind of writer, mm. you do feel something of the, the atmosphere of the show, the entertainment he enjoyed, mm. and he um, infects yes. you. And this really happens with good teaching, doesn't it? A good teacher. If he takes you into uh, the realm of English literature, poetry. I mean, my English teacher did. He infected me with a, with a spirit of poetry, you know what I mean? And he introduced me to pro poets, uh, most, mostly, I must admit, the romantics, probably, that was my mel melancholic leaning at the time, Shelley Keats, Byron, these sort of people. And um, I've lived with them ever since. I've enjoyed them because he infected me with them. But he didn't do it in any way destructively. Do you see what I mean? Mm. Exactly. Mm. He did it with love and affection. Mm. And I'm sure that the real, you know, the criticism that matters yes. in this sense is that kind of mm. thing, not the thing where they're turning a, a nice phrase, which is a good headline, or something clever, or something catty, or something malignant, which lingers in the memory for a day or so. And it's certainly only for a day or so. Do, do you get really melancholic about? Uh, yes. Back, do you, do you really I can't sure? bear it. I don't belong to a press cutting agency. There was a time when I longed to see my name in print. Now I see it with dread. 
But I, 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 and does it really affect you? Oh, I, I always believe it's true. I believe anything well, that, that's said against trouble. me is true. And anything that's said in my favor is flattery. Really? Yes, I never can believe <laughs> yes. that I'm any good at all. No, I, I think, again, well, I, I think yes. all artists desperately need the reassurance from the outside yes. of their own worth. They haven't got it within. Yes. I think this is one of the paradoxes of, uh, of all art, don't you? I mean, yes. that, that though they may appear very often, artists, to be people of power and strength, yes. in actual fact, the reverse is true. They're the most yes. vulnerable people in the world. Yes. I remember going backstage and meeting my idol at the time, Sir Godfrey Toe. Yes. And he actually said to me, I mean, he was giving a marvellous performance in the air, in the Haymarket, and I was sitting in his, his dressing room, I was full of awe, I was a very young actor, and very green, and I couldn't even find words to say how marvellous I thought his performance was. And he said to me, I've been terribly downcast because a woman brought her little boy to see it. He was ten, and he said, my trousers were too high and the socks were showing. <laughs> <laughs> and that worried him. Uh, Kenneth and uh, Maggie, can we talk a little bit now? We've been talking a bit about, about show business, about something that Sir John was talking about earlier, about the whole business of, of preservation and this sort of thing. Is it something that, that concerns you too? I mean, are you basically on Sir John's side on what he says about this? Hmm? Yes, I am. I... I, I... I see the problem in another way because I have two brothers and they're both architects and they say, but if we go on keeping things standing, uh, what else can we build? I suppose really our problem here is that we are just a small island. Mm. But the examples of planning light that you do see, things like the dreadfulness of the Elephant and Castle, which used to be a place of humanity and warmth uh, and people, which is now just a concrete uh, desert yes. and a mess and an absolute disgrace. Yes. And what they've turned the Euston Centre into is the same thing, just a, just a blight. Frightful. And this sort of thing is I really an absolute disgrace. Moreover, any government, well, exactly, I mean, any government, Central. and it was the Labour government, I believe, which had the power, could have, <laughs> could have, yes, could have, could have turned the whole thing into flats for people, left the whole thing standing empty all the time. It's a national scandal. There's nothing about it at all. The Office Development Permit, it was introduced by, by um, who was a man, um, the Lord, um, you know, the man that was Foreign Secretary, who was he under the Labour government, government administration? Oh, he introduced, uh, the, 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 Brown, uh, George Brown. George Brown. Yes, he introduced the office development uh, prohibition, you know, he stopped offices being built, but only in the last two years of the government, when it should have been done miles before the first act of our office socialist government, a government which says it's socialist, the first act they should make, is to stop all that and say, homes, homes, the most important thing, makes me sick when I read all this crap about, oh, let's have a youth club, let's have a theatre built, or let's have something else built. No good all that. Cultural activities are no good if there's no home to go to, is it? Absolutely true. Must have a home. Yes. So the first and requisite is possible on the ground. Well, I was going to say. Precisely. Precisely. <laughs> very angry about it. Yes. Mm. It really makes me very angry. Doesn't it you to pass a great thing empty, a great skyscraper mm. empty? Right. I absolutely I think it's an absolute that. scandal. Yes. And yet they can all get worked up over a, a couple of pounds in, in their pay packet or something and go on strike. Why can't they have, why can't, I mean, if unions really care, if they're really socialistic and say we care about our fellow man, why can't they force, why can't they march about something like that? Instead of another pound yes, for that, themselves, but that, why not a few pounds for somebody else who's really hard up? But that's not the what? union's problem. <laughs> It's not the union's fault. That, that, that's yes, the, what is that's the statue condition. outside the TUC? Have you looked at that statue? But the, the statue outside the TUC depicts a man helping, doesn't it? He's helping up another man who's on the ground. Yes. And that statue symbolizes what the TUC stands for, doesn't it? Of course. Right, well, when a union does something like jeopardizing the work of their fellow men, if you stop trains, people can't get to their work, can they? Can they? They can't get to work even. So in doing what you want for yourself, you're jeopardizing your fellow men, aren't you? Yes. Well, why can't you act in concert with your fellow men? Why do you have to do something which endangers the livelihood of your fellow men? When that statue represents exactly that, helping, because it not might, hindering. Because it might be that the fellow, um, that one fellow, to take two workers at one fellow, is a lot worse off than the other worker. They're not all equal, are they? I mean, if they were all equal, there'd be no problem. Precisely, but it comes down to a question of morality. You don't no, just no. work for another pound. When I took my job at three pound ten a week, I had seven in small parts. I come out the army, forty-seven. That's what I got. Forty-seven or three pound ten a week, and the digs were twenty-five bob all in, and the rest I had the soap and the fags, you know. And <laughs> the opposite of how I picked a shove round the bend because I did my own cleaning. <laughs> but 
I saved, and because I wanted to do the job and wanted to do it well, I got on, I got another rep fortnightly, and then after that I got monthly rep, you know, and I got a bit better. I did seven years in the provinces before I came to London. And I think if you're prepared to do that kind of thing, you're doing it. What are you doing it for? You're not saying I want another pound all the time. You're saying I want to do the work better. Yes, but... Now, that was Kenneth, the kind of morality but, I was brought up with. But, but, you don't do a job just for what you get. You do the job because but, but, you want to do it well. Oh, but Kenneth, can I say I think that's crap? <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I, mean, I really... I've never been so insulted. I... <laughs> Can I... <laughs> Who signed you on? <laughs> Frosty, it's all very well you saying that. It's all very well all of us here in jobs that are creative, where you can see if you go work, you've got a talent, you can get to the top and you can get, you know, handsome living. Now, you're not going to tell me that you are going to be compared with somebody who's sticking door handles on a car for, 20, for, for, for 10 hours a day, five days a week, that, that, that he's not going to get frustrated, that he doesn't deserve an extra quid if he wants one? Of course, his, his work, work ethic is money. It's got to be. He doesn't get the satisfaction from the job that we get. Well, I mean, that's true. You of course, talking... True. You talk... Me, don't, I, <laughs> Of course his it's true. His, his inference is, the man who's sitting in the doorknobs on has got a job that's monotonous and dreary. Absolutely. What do you think doing something night after night? I've done this play now at the Globe. I mean, I've said it so many times, I'm beginning to wonder what it means, you know. <laughs> you keep on saying anything long enough and you begin to think you're daft, don't you? I mean, yeah, that's the trouble. I mean, do, everybody does seem to think that our work is glamorous. It's fabulous. Right. They're fabulously glamorous. Not at all. It's a simple business of self-discipline and going on night after night and doing it as well as you can. Right, right. And if I have to stick right. doorknobs on, and I've done it, yes. I've like doorknobs, I'm not painting my own walls right. when I haven't got the money to employ a decorator. I do it because I like doing it, I want to do it well. But the other difference is, Kenneth, that the guy who goes on strike is not earning your salary. He's not earning four or five hundred quid a week. What about the period I didn't oh, have I any success sure. and I spent, what, seven years in the provinces bumming around? That wasn't very successful. No, of course not. But there was always, there was always a, because you backed your talent, because your talent went in, a, in, in, in an area where talent pays off in the end, then you had a horizon. You could see ahead. Well, what are you asking but for? A people... world where every single job leads to some marvellous end. Yes. Well, all yes. jobs can't be like that. Well, pr precisely. That, and that's the problem. But nevertheless... I mean, so therefore you must, you must allow people their frustrations. No, you, they must accept their limitations, surely. Oh, 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 come on. They must be allowed to... Well, a, that, 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 that's a Superman argument. It isn't. Voltaire said every man was sticking his own bit of garden. There wasn't much wrong with Voltaire's philosophy, was there? No. Sir John, <laughs> can we have a calm word? Because Kenneth and I are getting rather excited. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> by the way, do you know what they, you know what they say his last words were, Voltaire? No. They said, but the apparently a priest came and they said, you know, will you now, will you now make your peace and renounce the devil, renounce the devil and all his work? They said, oh, it's a bit late in the day to be making enemies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, John, you, were you going to say something? Um, about... I've forgotten. <laughs> And I don't blame you at all. I don't blame you at all. Poetry. Let's talk about poetry. For well, what, um, you, because... some of his lines have absolutely reverberated in my head. Yes. And we were talking about you the other day. You weren't there. And Ma Ma <laughs> Maggie was quoting a thing of yours, which has always stayed in her head. What was that line you were and saying? The phone for the fish knives, Norman. The phone for the fish knives, Norman. Oh, that yeah. phone. Yes. And I was saying the one that always stays in my head is the, you know, the prayer of the lady about the air raids. And says, Lord, keep beneath thy special care, 149 Cadogan Square. Which I love. Mm. Yes. And come friendly bombs and fall on slough. Yes, you shouldn't mention oh, the yeah, trouble that. I got oh. in. That. Did you have trouble in there? Yes, that was when I was a prep school master on 30 quid a term <laughs> in Gerrard's Cross. <laughs> All in, of course, but yes. still didn't leave you much for cigarettes. No. Uh, no harpic. No. <laughs> um, and what, what kind of problem did it, did it create? Did you. Well, they. Uh, you can't libel a corporation, thank goodness. You can libel an individual, like the borough engineer, or somebody like that, but not a conglomerate body. But they've always, uh, they've been very nice, generous to me in Slough, considering I was about 19 when I wrote that. And I'm now, goodness knows how old, 65, nearly 66. Uh, why it should be remembered, I can't think. In those days, there was a, it was very, everyone was very horrified by the new tendencies of uh, things coming. We could see the evil world of tall skyscrapers and nothingness yes. that we've been mm. describing arriving. And that was what the anger of that poem was about. And the lack of consideration 
for the individual, the separate person. Why I, I must go on for a second. Why I like actors very much and is because they're givers, not takers. Yes. And it's the takers we're always fighting against. You have to spend your whole time every day doing that thing of being en rapport with the audience. Very exhausting. Yes, <laughs> what one poet called the eternal reciprocity of tears. You see, what you, to understand about comedy is to understand that, because the pathos, which has got to be inherent in a comedy performance, if you haven't got it, you haven't got any comedy. If they're not really basically sorry and really identifying with your situation, there's a poem by Hal Burton somewhere about, you know, Caesar must die in them. You know, their lives must be rehearsed, their deaths must pass. Mm. Kenneth, we are sadly running out of time. It's a disgrace, you should have oh, much longer. Oh, I, I asked for over an hour last time. <laughs> <laughs> I was sandwiched in for a couple of minutes. It's a disgrace. <laughs> it really is. I tell you what, what, you don't have to make good use of those couple of <laughs> minutes, don't you? <laughs> Kenneth, you were going to read, I believe. Oh, Maggie. yes, I've got, I've got it here. I've got because it here. You, you like, Please. like me, are, are a, we, are we, we're not flattering. We are a bet Betjeman fan. Yes. No, yes, we were talking about this. And, and we're going to do this one. Yes. We're going to read mm -hmm. this together. Please. So now, this, this, you want to tell them the title? The, yes, the, the title is, is called Death in Leamington, and it's one of the earliest first poems you ever wrote, uh, Sir John. Yes, 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 First poems I got published, yes. F first published, yes. Could you? She died in the upstairs bedroom by the light of the evening star that shone through the plate glass window from over Leamington Spa. Beside her, the lonely crochet lay patiently and unstirred, but the fingers that would have worked it were dead as the spoken word. And nurse came in with the tea things, breast high mid the stands and chairs. But nurse was alone with her own little soul, and the things were alone with theirs. She bolted the big ground window. She let the blinds unroll. She set a match to the mantel. She covered the fire with coal. And tea, she said in a tiny voice. Wake up, it's nearly five. Oh, chintzy, chintzy cheeriness, half dead and half alive. Do you know that the stucco is peeling? Do you know that the heart will stop? From those yellow Italian arches, do you hear the plaster drop? Nurse looked at the silent bedstead, at the grey, decaying face, as the calm of a Leamington evening drifted into the place. She moved the table of bottles away from the bed to the wall, and tiptoeing gently over the stairs, turned down the gas in the hall. That's beautiful. You enjoyed that, didn't you? I love the night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> After a couple more shows with Kenneth, the relationship improved. In the end, we got on fine. We were never in danger of becoming bosom friends, but I admired his talent and felt sad that somehow he gave the impression of going through life being unfulfilled, both as an entertainer and a person. We've already seen why he was a popular guest on talk shows, but there were other reasons. For one thing, he needed little prompting to do a party piece. My next uh, number is a song of love. <laughs> uh, is uh, about uh, two people who are, you say, crossed in love. Uh, he loved her and uh, she loved him, but they cannot be uh, married because they are, how you say, husband and wife. <laughs> and he uh, is uh, entitled Macrep uh, Suzette, which means a flaming hot dish. <laughs> So is Suzette. On est qui Blanc tendre restaurant Jacques Cousteau et Saint-Laurent Où aille la plume des matins 
toute la vie ma crêpe <rire> Trop sage, massage, <rire> près de Jacques. <rire> Salon, par avion, pète la classe. Et on sait ensemble l'ognette lingerie de toilette gauloise cigarette entourage ma frêpseuse citron mirage carvet Oh, Dove, Brute et Chanel <rire> Chaise Lange, Sacha Dessel <rire> Fuselage, ma crêpe Suzette <rire> Bidet <rire> Commissionnaire Mon repos, Brigitte Bardot je sens frontière. C'est un orcan. Le French a mis dans ça. Au grand prix, espionnage, grillère, camembert, fromage, mayonnaise, all night, garage. That was from a show we recorded in 1979. My favourite moments with Williams were when he displayed his remarkable talent for accents and anecdotes. The first time I ever interviewed him was in 1972, and he was eager to show off to his new audience. The other guests were the late and very lamented Patrick Campbell and Frank Muir, whom God preserve. You worked with, with uh, some of the great um, ladies of the theatre, haven't you? Um, Yes, Maggie that's Smith. true. Um, uh, Dame Edith. Yes, e yes, Edith, in fact, I was told on that authority afterwards, uh, said, why have you cast him? Why have you cast Kenneth Williams? <laughs> and apparently the producer said, he's very good, he'd be very good in the role. And she said, but he's got such a peculiar voice. <laughs> 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 and then after that, of course, I did that thing with Bergman, and she was fascinating. In fact, I found all these women, I mean, people like Martita Hunt, uh, who I did Paradiso with, she, you know, people said to me before, oh, be careful, you know, be very careful because, all oh, there, she's a formidable woman and all this stuff. I found they were charming and delightful to get on with. Mm. And in fact, Guinness helped me out marvellously, because I came on that brothel sequence, I was supposed to come in and say, oh, uncle, what a night I've had. And I'd forgotten in the, in the dressing room, I'd unzip the flies because the trousers were terribly tight, so I unzipped them and used to sit reading my book and then go straight on. And I forgot to do them up. And I, I came on and he, he kept covering me and saying, it's very interesting to see you, you know. <laughs> and playing the scene with me behind him. And I thought, well, this is a bit much. <laughs> you know, I'm not even getting a look in. <laughs> and uh, when we came into the wings, I said, dear, you confronted me all the time. And he said, what's your flowers? I said, oh, I said, oh, dear, yes. <laughs> Didn't realize that and did them up again. And he said, always remember, before you go on the stage, blow your nose and check your flies. <laughs> and I thought, well, it is marvellous advice. I never forgot it. I, I what about accents? Do you, I mean, do you have any sort of, have you arrived at any conclusions about accents, about what shapes them? I think I probably it's a lot to do with climate. I think the fact that the northern countries, you know, Scandinavian or whatever, uh, use the mouth so much, and the German with the umlaut, and the, you know, ich weiß nicht, was alles bedeutet, das ist so traurig wie ein Weg, and all these sort of sounds, and the Scotch with their and those guttural sounds. And the, the mouth is used much more in the north than it, say, is in the, um, the warm climate, the east, where, you know, China and Japan, the lips hardly when you come up there. And, and the French is sort of, with this sort of uh, nasal, isn't it? It's all... Uh, <laughs> Whereas, um, and I think it's climate has a lot to do with that. Yes. I think climate, and plus the fact that um, 
you get these curious idiosyncrasies. The fact that, you know, the generous R is so prevalent in the West Country. I think is, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's something to do with the fact that the Americans, so they sailed from there, didn't they, the Plymouth lot? I think that's why the Americans today have got those boys those lovely R's, because uh, in the West Country, they're still doing their R's right now, you know, all that with the bar, don't they? And those generosity of vowels, tremendously generous vowels, aren't they? Whereas the English governing accent is not at all generous. It's frankly clear, abominable secretary. I mean, yes, he is all year, secretary, my secretary, mm. abominable. The, the and whereas the French would say abominable, wouldn't they? Yeah. When you get the whole thing given to you, whereas the English, all the snob stuff's all pinched off. The middle class <laughs> thing, that awful sort of, you know, that awful frightful sort of, you know, that one, you know, they don't call me now, they don't call me frightful, you know, you know. It's so incredibly tight assed, you think, oh, what's that? That's a you Kenneth Williams died in 1988. He was 62. In 40 years or more as an entertainer, he gave an enormous amount of pleasure through his work as an actor, broadcaster, and comedian. On the very last Parkinson's show of all, recorded in 1982, we asked him to recreate Rambling Sid Rumpo, one of the characters he played in that marvelous radio series, Round the Horn. And that's what we close with tonight. Dearios, I've been digging in my gander bag and I come up with a lugubrious lyric about love sick Swain singing to his light of love beneath her bower. She has a very low bower, but then that is because of the prevailing winds. <laughs> As it hung upon the line, <laughs> so he stole a woggler's moolly for to make a wedding ring. But the Bow Street runners caught him, and the judge said, You will swing. <laughs> oh, 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 they hung him. <laughs> oh, oh, they hung him by the postern. <laughs> Nailed his moolly to the fence. <laughs> Or to warn all young court wanglers that it was a grave offence. There's a moral to this story, though your cord wangle be poor, keep your hands off others' moolies, for it is against the law. <laughs>